last talk or read my article, you will probably remember the first half of it. That is new. Um, so one of the first things I've done was just to try out the performance characteristics of one of the, one SD card that I've gotten hold of um, and applied very simple patterns, reading and writing from it. What I found out was, first of all, reading is almost always if you read large enough blocks. And 64 kilobytes seems to be the cutoff for this particular card and for many, many other cards. Um, if, you, if you read 64K, it's always around 13 megabytes per second read. And writing, if you're writing the whole card linearly from start to end, it's about the same you get to 11 or 12 megabytes per second. And as you get below that, it gets significantly worse. Um, the interesting part is when you get to random writes. So on this particular card, um, and if you're doing a 4 megabyte aligned write of a multiple of 4 megabytes, you're just as fast doing random access as doing linear access. But if you get anything closer than that, there's a dramatic cut in the performance for random writes. Um, and that is even within one 4 megabyte section. So if you pick one 4 megabyte section, you write it all at once, you're always fast. If you write, them, write the same data in random order, it's much slower. And you get even, even slower than that when you're writing alternate blocks. Like you pick two 4 megabyte blocks, and then you just write the first two megabyte on them on each card, and then the other two megabyte on, uh, on sorry, on the on one block and then the other two megabyte on each block and then the you're already much slower and so on. Up to a few kilobytes a second when you do 64 kilobyte blocks alternating linearly between the two blocks. And then there seems to be a special optimization because all the SD cards are shipped with FAT32 and they know the layout, they actually optimize it in a way uh, that the position where the fat is stored behaves completely different from all the rest. So in random writes, uh, this is much, much faster than this one. And you can always write to the fat area in between uh, writing to somewhere else without making it slower. So that made me very, very curious to see what's actually going on under the covers. Um, the, the common knowledge about flash media and what I've learned about it in the process is it's always fast to read randomly. Um, you can write flash drive low, on the low level within pages. Pages are typically two or four kilobytes nowadays and they are grouped in super pages because most of the flash media have multiple planes or you have multiple channels, each with one flash chip and you're basically doing RAID zero of them. So um, if you want it to be fast, you have to write a page to each plane and each channel at the same time. So the, the, op the, the minimum write size is something like 16 or 32 kilobyte. Um, and on Flash, you can never write something again that you've already written unless you erase it first. And an erase is done in a, in, in a block size of typically uh, 4 megabyte on flash media, that's what we observe. The underlying size is typically 2 megabyte or something like that. Um, and then you have got multiple planes and channels that you're writing at the same time, and that's how it gets larger. The largest erase block size that I've seen is 16 megabyte on a USB stick that I recently bought. Um, the smallest that you see in new devices would be about 1 megabyte. And you also see something that's not a power of 2. So uh, 3 megabyte or 1.5 or 6, that's, that's getting quite common as well. Then I've done some experiments just trying to find out uh, what the card is doing. And I prepared another card and got to this behavior. Um, this is just reading pages naturally aligned on different positions on the, on the card. So on the X axis you can see um, the position in megabyte, 
this is zero, this is four megabyte, eight megabyte, you probably can't read the numbers here, up to 32 megabyte. Um, and I prepared the drive, I erased it completely at first, and then wrote to some sections of it. Um, I wrote basically all this data, then wrote somewhere else, and then wrote just one sector in here. Um, what happens is the, the read performance that you see um, depends a lot on what's actually going on. Um, the, the fat area, um, that's where uh, the, the one that behaves completely different from all the others, has a different read performance all the time. Um, reading from an, a block that doesn't actually contain data, that has been erased or comes pre-shipped, is really, really fast, um, which is really good for benchmarking when you get a new drive and you read from it. That's, that's very useful because the drive knows there's no data on it. Uh, I don't actually have to read it. Once the data has been written successfully, uh, you get this average speed, and there's actually two speeds alternating between slightly faster and a slightly slower sector. That's because this card is an MLC card, which means that it has um, it can store two bits within one transistor, and it actually alternates between the lower bit and the higher bit on page boundaries. And this is the one that I'm currently writing to, which means it's, some parts are cached in the controller, something else is going on, whatever that is. Yes, question? Oh, wait, wait, wait. sorry, can you? What? what does that open segment close segment? So that, that's what I mean. An open segment is the one that we're currently writing to. A closed segment is one that we haven't written to in a long time, but that has been pre previously written. And I, I, I'll, come, I'll explain this in great length after this. Um, so essentially, the, the whole drive is made up of segments that are each one of these logical erased blocks that contain multiple physical erased blocks, typically four megabyte somewhere between one megabyte and 16 megabyte in practice today and growing over time. So a few years ago, it was um, typically one megabyte and a few years before that was typically 128 kilobyte. But the same principle still applies. So you've got um, this very simplified graph and normally you've got many, many more of these segments, but in this case, I'm only showing one segment for the fat of a USB stick, for example, a few, and a few segments that are used by the drive, and some that are, that are still erased. Like as you can see here, this would be one that has never been written, so it's marked as free here. Um, and the others contain data, which means they are backed by a physical segment or physical erase block, um, and they occupy one erase block each on the physical storage. The FAT as an optimization typically is made up of more than one erase block, so they can write more intelligently to it and you can always make random updates while you're writing files at the same time. Um, some blocks are just unused and there's, al there's almost always a much larger number of free physical blocks than free logical blocks. And some blocks may just be bad from, from the factory, that's quite normal for flash. And some blocks go bad over the time of use. And that means they're, they're entered into the bad list, and other blocks are in the free list. So that's how basically all the cheap flash media are organized. So what happens when we write to one of these? So we let's assume we pick the last free block because we've never written to it. So software decides, I'm writing to this block. Um, we must first allocate a physical block, which gets taken from the free list. So this block still, not, still has no data, and then we write the new yellow data into this green erase block. Um, and once we've written it, I'm displaying that as white. And so we go on, and until we've completely written this erase block, and now it's part of the logical drive and all the data can be read back from there. Um, but 
that's the easy case. That only happens when you first write a brand new media or when you have erased it once. Now, assuming we write again to another erase block that already is associated with one physical erase block. Since I explained we can never write something again that we've already written before erasing it, we have to pick an erase block that is free. So we take one from the free list, and at this point the logical erase block will be associated with two physical erase blocks. One that already contains all the data, and one that does not contain any data yet. And then we start writing data to it, and at this point, part of this logical erase block is this yellow bit here, and part is this white, white bit here, and this gray bit is no longer visible, but it's still there in the erase block. Um, because we cannot erase it without destroying the rest of the data. And then we continue writing the rest of this erase block um, until we, we leave it at this point, and we can then start writing to another erase block. So at this point, we still have some data in here, this white bit, and some data in this white bit. And then we write to another erase block. So now we've got multiple partial erase blocks, um, and we can take turns writing to them. At the point when one block is completely unused, so it's in, the, in this graph it's completely gray, we can just erase it back and put it back on the free list. This is basically the operation how all the SD cards work. And um, I've seen some SSDs like the, the low-end SanDisk SSDs and I think some Jmicron and Python controllers, they all do the same thing. If you get a proper SSD, they work completely differently, um, not at all related to this. Um, right, and one more thing, uh, when, we, when we're writing to this, we can always, while writing to it, do a fat write, and we don't need a, anything on the free list because the fat will handle this internally, which is not true on all these media, but on a lot of them. Right, and we can also erase one block. So on on many uh, on, on some kind of drives like EMMC and SD card and proper SSDs, you can issue an erase command or trim or something like that, and that will put one erase block back on the free list. And that's the basic operation. Now we should look what happens within one erase block. So this is I'm using the same colors here, but it's a completely different graph. So this whole block here is one of the one of these logical erase blocks. Um, this, these are two physical erase blocks. And in the beginning of this picture, each logical block within the erase block points to one physical block within the physical within the single physical erase block. This is true at most times for most blocks on your drive. Um, so we write some yellow data again, and then it picks the appropriate block on the new physical segment. This is, where, this is the point when we have part of the data uh, in one erase block and part in another. And then we can start writing the next one, and so on. If we, on this particular kind of media, want to write something that's not right next after the last block we've written, like here we want to write the yellow one, we first need to copy, the, the card first needs to copy all the data uh, in between. And this write access that the software wants to do is blocking, waiting for the card. Um, and then it can finally write this erase block. And the same happens for this card um, when we want to write something again that we've already written, like this one. So the card first copies all the old data moves it to the rest the rest of the free space in the new physical block, new physical erase block, and then the, the complete erase block is gone and we can erase it. Um, and now this becomes our old block, we can allocate a new erase block and um, copy yet one more block into that. And then finally the card will write 
this one block, all behind the covers. So you can try this on, on many cheap SD cards, like the, the Kingston brand usually does it exactly this way. If you try to write the same sector over and over again, you will notice that it takes the same amount of time to write the 512 byte block the same location all the time again as it takes to write 4 megabyte all the time again because you always end up copying all the data over before you can write the same block again. This algorithm is implemented in a lot of cards that are optimized for linear addressing. Um, a good use case of this would be video recording. Like when we're recording the video, here it probably ends up on an SD card which is written from start to end, and this is the optimum algorithm for this because we never actually write the same block uh, twice in a row. Um, but there's, there are multiple algorithms, and I'm just explaining the two most important ones here. Most of the cards that we normally want to use use some use a different <coughs> algorithm. Um, and I'm calling that data logging garbage collection because it's sort of like a log structured file system. Um, the association between the logical blocks within one erased block and the physical blocks within the physical erased blocks can be random. Like there's, there's some kind of lookup table that it stores. It doesn't have to do this, but uh, yeah, that in, the, in one organization that, that's how it actually works. Um, so we can write a random block and we'll just change the pointer, pick the next three block out of the new physical erase block, write that and update the pointers. This point can write anything. We can fill this up. So even if we write something that has already been written, um, this point, it will just move the pointer here. And now we've got stale data in both erase blocks and fresh data also in both. And when we, get, when we fill up the second erase block, um, what usually happens is that we'll have to do a garbage collection. Some of them can also back one logical erase block by more than two, um, actually up to quite a number of physical erase blocks. Um, but uh, this is the, the simple case. So when this happens, um, the card will have to do much more. It will first have to allocate a third erase block to, to just store all the data. So it copies all the blocks from the really, really old physical block. Then it copies all the blocks from the recently new, now old erase block to fill up the, the one erase block like this. And now we can finally write, when we finally want to write the, the block that the software has been waiting for all the time, it will actually have to allocate the fourth erase block. Um, so it's really good for random access. You can write the same sector all over again all the time, uh, but occasionally it has to do much more work to, to clean this back up. Those are the basic two algorithms that we've seen being applied in cards. Um, yes, that's the end of this. Are there any questions to this point? I know this, this was a lot of information. Some people might have not heard this before. Uh, yes. So the, the question was, do, do I have access to the internals of the SD cards or did I reverse engineer it? This was almost all done by reverse engineering, by doing a timing attack. After I had talked about this before, I talked to some people that were involved with SD card design and basically confirmed what I had found out. And gave me some, some extra hints, some of which I'm not talking about. That, that's an excellent question. Have I seen differences between the way that Windows and Linux access uh, format cards? Uh, I can talk for a very long time about this. Um, first and foremost, there's a significant difference between how Windows and Linux format cards and what the SD card standard requires you to format a card to provide perfect, uh, 
performance behaviors. Now, in particular, the SD card standard says you have to put the partition at an erase block boundary of 4 megabyte, well, up to 4 megabyte. I, I don't know exactly how it's standardized, but all the SD cards use they claim they have a 4 megabyte erase block, even if they do something completely different, and they all align the partition to 4 megabyte, which is a completely sensible thing to do, but it's not what Linux does, and it's also not what Windows does by default. Windows has a 1 megabyte alignment. Linux traditionally starts a partition at the same offset as MS-DOS in old versions, which is sector 63, which is not aligned at all. And that's, com that's very, very painful for these cards. So sometimes um, you usually get them, get at most half the performance that you should be getting if you do this. Sometimes it's much worse than that. No. Does that completely answer the question? <laughs> yes, I'm not. I'm not. The question is how do I erase the card? I've written a small tool that calls the IO control to, that, that's available in the kernel for erasing a card, for erasing a block device. Um, I can show you the source code, it's really simple. Um, might not be the nicest source code, but that's it. I mean, you basically have to call the IO control block this card. And it only works on SD cards with re relatively recent kernels, and it does not work on compact flash. It does never work on a USB. Yes, another one. Uh, okay, when there, when there are cards that are fast, slow, or don't work at all, uh, there's no easy way to tell. So, I've to, yeah, let me just go, go on with my, my talk for a while. That, so, I can see, I can show you some of the, the other things that I, that I found out. Um, so, the, actually, the, the worst case, like, I, I said that there's a pool of three erase blocks in each of those cards and USB sticks. This pool is of a variable size. Some cards have larger pools, some cards have smaller pools. Kingston has a pool of one. Other, uh, other cards usually have like five, six, up to 20. And I've seen one USB stick, or I think it was an SSD that has 125, maybe 128. Um, but usually it's something between five and 10, if you're lucky. Um, so what happens, we're, this is the same picture as in the beginning. So we're writing to some blocks um, until we run out of, oh, sorry. At this point, we have run out of erase blocks. So the, the free list is empty. We want to write here. Here is already fully written. Um, what we have to do is make one block free. So the card picks one, um, writes all the data from the, its old erase block. So this, this logical erase block is connected to an old one and a new one. So it copies all the data from the old erase block to the new erase block, puts it on the free list, and then we can start writing to this one. And then the next thing that happens is we write somewhere else. Um, so we pick another erase block that's half used, clean that up, put it on the free list, and then we can reuse it. And that's what happens when you do random access to uh, one of the, these media. So if you're doing random access on any cheap USB stick, SD card, CF card, anything like that, means you always, with each write access, end up doing a full write of the erase block of up to 16 megabyte. So if your erase block size is 4 megabyte, um, your accesses are 4 kilobytes, and you do random access, you've got a write amplification, as we call it, of a, of a factor of 1,000, uh, which is not good. So you should never do random access on these. And most parts don't do completely random access, but to some degree, it's, it's always random. Um, so I'm going back to this graph, so what happens here? This card actually has, uh, it can only do the first algorithm. It can only do linear access within one erase block. So random write is much, much slower than linear write. I've got other cards that use the second algorithm, and on these, the random write is exactly the same performance as the linear write. That's basically the way how you can tell them apart. If you're using, if you're planning to use a Linux file system, ext3 or ButterFS or anything like that, 
on one of these media, you should try to use one of those that can do random writes. Um, and alternately, writing to two erase blocks, and this card does not work, which means the number of open erase blocks is one. Uh, so this card is completely unusable. Never put a card that behaves like this into a file system. So even if you do all the alignment correct, you use the best possible file system, it just won't work. Um, and in Linaro, we've made this another project of my work. Pixie has been doing really great work on this. Um, he wrote a tool to basically put uh, encode all the algorithms that I have found out by reverse engineering. Um, into one program and use the application of block trace files. So block trace is a small tool that allows you to read, uh, to, to record every if it's a read, if it's a write, what the size, who, what was the process that was doing it. We just take the write accesses because reads are free anyway. Um, and then um, it pretends that it is one of these cards with, with certain characteristics, with one specific erase block size, one page size, one number of erase blocks, and one algorithm, which you can all give on the command line. And all, all the tool will output is the write amplification factor. Um, and this is what we found out um, just by taking block traces of different workloads. What, this, what these workloads do is um, the tool takes a block trace of first doing a debut strip on um, an SD card, unpacking a whole file system, um, doing lots of F-Sync, uh, then writing files around, unpacking a tarball, deleting the, the same files from the tarball, doing a git clone of a kernel directory, um, doing a checkout of some specific version of that, doing kernel build, checking out another version, and doing an untar again after all this has happened on the file system. And the numbers are very, very interesting. As you can see very clearly, <coughs> xt4 is almost always superior to xt3, which is not really a surprise because they put a lot of work into making it better. Um, xt3 is, for the most part, much worse than, uh, somewhat worse than xt2, except for some cases which are a lot better. Um, but essentially the answer is, if you want to use something of the xt2, xt3, xt4 family, use xt4, which will work relatively well on this card with these workloads, and probably on most other combinations as well. UltraFS, in a lot of cases, is significantly better. Um, so for the untar case, um, the, as an example, you will untar a, a file that has 100 megabytes, on ext4, this factor would mean the card would internally write 429 megabytes, uh, while on butterfs, the same card would write only 262 megabytes, which takes a lot less time and a lot less aging on the card, because you, each block in the card can be written only a certain number of times, and if you write too much to it, it's dead. You can throw it away. There's one case, which is deleting files, which is really, really bad for ButterFS. Um, and apparently they're working on that. ButterFS also takes a lot more space, so that's why we don't have a number here, because at this point the drive was full. <laughs> now taking the same example with a different... Um, so this card would be a reasonable car. Something you get typically from Zenders, it can write to five erase blocks of two megabytes, or something like that, eight kilobytes in data logging. This case would be the car that I've shown you earlier. It can only write to one erase block at a time, and can only do it in linear mode. And it's the exact same block traces apply to these to, to these workload uh, to to these to this one card. And you see the. Uh, and the, the worst case that we've seen goes up from a factor of 69 to a factor of 337, uh, uh, which is incredibly bad. And also for the xt 2 case, you've got really, really bad numbers here. This basically tells you that this card is unusable. When you've got such a high factor, it means you end up waiting for minutes and you do a simple thing on your, on your card. 
Um, another data point that we get out of this is um, we can compare different cards. Um, in this case, just taking the, the two most sensible file systems, ButterFS XD4, take, uh, assume that we've got two megabytes. We've got too many variables in this, so I'm, I can only show a small section of this. The yep, number of open erase blocks between 1 and 10, there's nothing much interesting happening between 5 and 10, so I'm leaving these out and pretending that we have different block sizes. So 16 kilobyte would be the most common one in this scenario. Um, and one thing that you can tell here is when you get from 1 to 2 or from 2 to 3 erase blocks in ButterFS, <coughs> it gets significantly better, but beyond 3 erase blocks, there's not much difference at all. With, uh, with ext4 on the, on the other hand, um, it starts out much worse for the one erase block count, like in the really, really bad cards. Um, and then it gradually gets better as you, add open, uh, as you add more concurrently open erase blocks. No. But even as you get to 10 erase blocks, you're just about at the point where you would be with ButterFS with three. So if you've got a, a card that can only have three erase blocks concurrently open, um, you should never use XT4 on those drives. ButterFS would perform a lot better, at least for a fresh person. For an age person, we haven't done really much testing yet. Taking the same thing, with the same output for uh, a card with the same algorithm, but an 8 megabyte erase block size. And as I said, the erase block sizes are growing continuously. They go, they are at 4 megabyte right now, they will be at 12 megabyte or 16 or 24 in the near future, in the coming years. Um, that much magnifies the same problem. So if you've got one that has 8 megabyte erase blocks, but only one of them open, you're back in the in the position where it just doesn't make any sense to use this for a root file system. And uh, again, ButterFS at three erase blocks, it's pretty reasonable. So the numbers are not much worse than with the two megabyte case here. XT4 uh, loses out horribly. But as, as we get to larger block sizes, which happens at the same time as larger erase block sizes, um, also ButterFS gets really, really bad. And I, I think they're also working on that. So one thing that, I, that I'm working on together with Volker Schneider. Volker, I, I, can you just stand up? Are you? Ah, that's Volker. He's working on, on a file system prototype um, as an intern at IBM for his uh, bachelor thesis. Um, so he's implementing a minimal fuse-based file system that should theoretically have the ideal performance characteristics on um, all the media that we've analyzed, at least all the media that are not in the completely insane category as the cards that I've talked about, uh, the, the, some of the, the worst cards that I've talked about. Uh, so the right amplification factor should always be one. Okay. And you can see these URLs. Uh, we've now got a Git repository. There's nothing on there yet, but there will be. Um, there's a design for the file system that we put together, which you can find here. Um, and you can also find it through Google. Um, the basic design of this file system is that we organize the whole data in terms of erase blocks when we know what the erase block size is and we know all the other characteristics from the card. Without that, you can't really do an optimal implementation. Um, we use clusters because all of these drives are basically optimized for Microsoft Windows devices. Clusters are generally not such a good idea, but there's not really a good way to work around that. And in Linux, the page cache is organized in two kilobyte pages, which we can't really change. So that's a lot of pain for us to implement a file system that has clusters larger than pages. But we basically try to give it a go anyway. So 64 kilobyte would be a really good size for a cluster because it's the size that Windows uses to access drives and that's why drive manufacturers use that as the size they optimize for. Um, and we also want to 
separate different kinds of data into separate erased blocks. The thing is, um, if you want to do an optimum uh, file system, you have to do some kind of garbage collection. Uh, but I'll get to that in a, in a second. So you, the, you don't do garbage collection inside of the card anymore, which is what I've shown previously, but the file system has to do it more intelligently. Um, and that is ideally done by separating code and hot data. Um, and I'll get to that in a second. So the whole file system also ends up being copy on write for both data and most of the other data. The organization of data in the file system doesn't use any of the fancy extents or B trees or anything like that. It's just it just uses three different kinds of files depending on the file size. So the most basic one would be we have an inode stored somewhere on the file system and inside of the inode we just have the data in there. And the inode can grow up to one cluster, whatever the cluster size is that we use for this file system. Um, and then uh, actually slightly less than the cluster size because we also have the inode metadata. So if you have a 64 kilobyte cluster, we would have some, let's say 128 bytes data and the rest of the 64 kilobytes um, can be the actual user data. If you want to go beyond one cluster or exactly one cluster, you have to do indirect inodes. Um, so we put pointers to the data in cluster numbers into the inode in the same place where we would otherwise store the data. So we can have, we can fill the cluster up with pointers to other clusters, which is fairly similar to what um, traditional Unix file systems do and ext4 is one of those, except that our clusters are much larger and the inodes are much larger. So we can, uh, even with the smallest possible cluster size of 4K, we can have almost 1024 pointers to other 1024 byte clusters in there, which means 4 megabyte file is the maximum for this. If we go to 64 kilobyte clusters, we can basically go unlimited with it. So it's um, 16,000 pointers to 64,000, uh, 64 kilobyte clusters, but sometimes that might not be enough. So there's a third way, which would mean instead of point having pointers to clusters for really large files, we just put pointers to erase blocks in there. So we can have 64 kilobyte worth of erase block numbers, which is essentially unlimited. Um, and as I said, we should separate hot and cold data. What this means is uh, the, the hottest data that we have is global metadata. That's, for example, the information, where do we find an inode, which is constantly written to. And it's in the beginning, we use the trick that this is stored in the position where uh, a FAT32 file system would store the file allocation table, because we know that almost any drive can do um, random access on that. Um, so that's the, the, the hottest kind of data. Then we have the rather hot data, um, which is any sort of metadata. Um, and that's very easy to understand, because when you're writing a lot of files to one directory, you constantly update the directory, but you only update each file once. So the directory, by definition, is much hotter than the uh, file. And if you're constantly appending to one file, you also have to always update the inode, so the inode is always hotter than the file. For new data, we have no clue how cold or hot it normally is, so we treat it as warm. And when we do garbage collection, we move data around that has not been recently touched, so we know that it's cold and we can put it into yet another space. And if we use a separate erase block for each of these categories, um, then we have very good separation between hot and cold data. And when we want to do a garbage collection, we most likely only need to garbage collect the hottest data. And we don't have time for a demo now. If you really want to see how I got to the data, um, that is the optional part that I didn't get to, 
uh, then you can come to me later and you can measure your own cards and I can show you how I found this all out. Um, and then we have some optimizations that are still planned, uh, some parts that we want to modify the, the buffer cache so we can actually deal with more than four kilobyte pages. Um, there's one idea that uh, we use the, the flash drive for a cache for a real hard drive. We can use the same method to optimize flash storage in normal block devices, uh, sorry, in, in red, just block devices, making them more optimal. Um, the elevator has some things to optimize and obviously the file system that we do, that's where we, we're heading with the prototype file system, trying to get that the, the optimizations ported back into butter FS and ext and others. Um, that's a word from our sponsor, and I open this up for more questions. Um, yes. um, so FAT and FAT32, uh, FAT and XFAT are not really usable for many, for a lot of people because they, they're missing lots of features, they're heavily patented, and they also don't have ideal access characteristics. So ButterFS is probably the best we can do right now. Um, with, when we get the prototype fully working, that might be better than ButterFS for this kind of media. It will certainly be but much better than XFAT, which doesn't actually care about the race blocks, uh, which you absolutely have to do. And, uh, and XFAT has the other problem that it always overrides the data in place. The question is, is the test program in the state that we can point random people to that? I would rather not do that. Um, it's relatively user unfriendly. It's very hard to get right to use because it's an interactive process. It took me a long time to really understand a lot of the different algorithms and the corner cases. The more important issue is um, it will destroy the data on the card that's currently there. And most people that you randomly point to expect that their file system still is alive after you run it. So I've had a few complaints from people that said, oh, my data is gone. <laughs> um, yes, it should be more clear in the documentation, but there's not, it's really not. Uh, it, I think it's a useful tool. What I really want to do is get, that, get the, the, it, um, the algorithms into the MakeFS tools, make, make X2, X4 FS, make butter FS, and have that automatically. Determined. And I'm getting a stop signal. I don't know if it's the best time for any more questions. But I'll come to me. Maybe one more. Uh, you basically in your new file system, you are uh, just bypassing uh, the, the SD card uh, um, write um, mechanism. So wh why not using uh, UBFS or something like that? Uh, why not what? Uh, UBFS. Um, okay, the, the question is why not use something like UBIFS on the SD cards? Uh, that would be, of course, very helpful if we had access to the raw flash. Um, the, the reality is that everyone's moving away from raw flash to EMMC and similar technologies because of cost reasons, and then we don't have any physical access to the underlying flash. We have to go through this awful block abstraction layer. Yes, but you, you are basically, can I you do a like a glue layer because you know the characteristic and the algorithm how uh, they actually do the raw access so you can uh, just do uh, logical block access to simulate physical access and well the, if the idea is to, to simulate well basically we, we are implementing what you suggest with the yes I didn't really have time for that with the uh, flash cache device mapper target, which would implement the same algorithms that UBI uses, so we can use any normal block based file system. Using UBIFS on top of this would not really work out so well because of things that I can explain to you okay. in, in more length. Any other urgent questions for the round? Otherwise, you can.